The Dallas Cowboys have wrapped up practice in Oxnard. Who was the best player at camp and who was their most improved player? All that and more in this episode of the Locked On Cowboys podcast. You are Locked On Cowboys, your Locked daily Dallas Cowboys on. podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Locked Network, your on. team every Locked day. On. Locked On. Locked, Locked On. Locked On Cowboys. Locked On Cowboys. Welcome back to the Locked On Cowboys podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We want to thank you for making us your first listen of the day. We are free and available on all platforms. I am Marcus Mosher. You can follow me on Twitter at Marcus underscore Mosher. He is Landon McCool. Check him out on Twitter at McCoolBCB. Landon, what's going on, sir? Uh, not much. I, I'm, I'm not in Denver. Thank goodness, because I've heard it's incredibly hot there. Uh, but I am excited to uh, see exactly what the Cowboys produce uh, in these practices uh, coming up with Denver. But now is the time to kind of look back at uh, their time in Oxnard and kind of, you know, levy some awards and some mm-hmm. uh, accolades where they where they are appropriate. Yeah. So we're wrapping up the the Cowboys practices in Oxnard, and let's just go ahead and start with the, the most obvious one, Landon. Uh, your award for the best player in Oxnard was? I mean, Micah Parsons. Yeah. I think, uh, yeah. you know, I mean, again, we kind of have talked about it yesterday that it's difficult to, um, you know, it's, it's, there hasn't been a lot of hype videos. There hasn't been a ton of, of, uh, you know, stuff to kind of glean onto that, that gets you super hyped about Micah Parsons because, anything that Micah Parsons does along those lines gets, you know, the, the snap gets cut short before he gets to do anything yep. truly exciting, like hit a quarterback or anything. So anything violent. Yeah. So I, I think it's, it's e- like we said, it's easy to kind of overlook him and overlook what he's been doing, but uh, he's, he's shown out here that he's clearly on track for more of what he's had last year, if not an acceleration of what he had, um, and I think as far as, you know, on a snap per snap basis, it's hard to argue that uh, Michael Parsons isn't the best player out here. Yeah, that would have been my answer as well. We should just mention Zach Martin just because he's Zach Martin and he's always going to be, you know, arguably mm-hmm. the best offensive lineman in football. But it's hard to tell that in some non padded practices, practices were not go- going at full speed. But I think Parsons or Zach Martin are your clear answers here. Yeah. I think so too. I mean, okay. Dak had really good practices all throughout for the most part. I mean, maybe a couple of throws he'd like to have back here and there, but um, yeah, I, I don't know that I saw Zach Martin lose a rep. And uh, I, I, I on and with Parsons, they basically you know only let him do a couple things before he would start destroying yep. the entirety of practice. So yeah, yep. I, I think we're solid on those. Yeah, guys. we're good. Uh, we can move on from that one. Next one, most improved player. And this is really hard, right? Because, I mean, there's so many guys that I feel like that have improved so much uh, in, this, in these last few days or weeks. Um, I'm going to say Simi Fahoku. Yeah, see, that was the name I had as well. Good. I mean, just like from where we had his expectations before the season, where from what we saw based on last year's training camp, what we saw during the regular season and what little we did see of him in the regular season. Um, he just, he looks like a completely different player. He looks like a guy who's ready to not only make the roster, but contribute in some form. I don't know if he's, you know, wide receiver three or anything like that, but I think he's certainly ready to come in there and take snaps if needed. He could be an asset to the offense, right? Absolutely. I mean, he, I think he could step in and play that kind of Cedric Wilson role uh, really well in the sense that of that kind of first off the bench, maybe, um, you know, we'll, there's another guy who I think set a really, really good camp we'll him, I think, uh, that I think we'll have something to say about that. Um, but I think that, you know, as far as a trust factor, or at least, you know, starting to build a trust factor for a guy that uh, will probably see some playing time this year. Uh, I, it's hard to argue that Simi Fahoku hasn't improved leaps and bounds as to where he was the last time we saw him on the field. It, and that's who I had as well, because I think at times last year, he was actually a little bit detrimental to the team because he wasn't helping on special teams. He was on the active roster, and I felt like there was better players in the practice squad that could have, be take, could have been taking his spot. We didn't see anything from him in, in training camp that made us excited. Nothing really in the preseason, and then certainly nothing in the regular season. 
Now we're talking about him as, hey, this guy could help with the wide receiver rotation early in the year. I think that's a pretty big step up for him. Absolutely. You know, I, I think the other guy we could have mentioned here is I, I'm so shocked and impressed with how Tyler Smith has developed in just a short amount of time. But I think if we're talking about, you know, full progression and, and changing the, the shape of who you think that player is, Simi Fahoku is, is a pretty solid answer. I, I also wrote down Anthony Brown, and I don't know if that's necessarily fair to put him on a most improved list because he was pretty good last year, but it just seems like he's kind of continued that positive momentum from last season into training camp. I, yeah, I mean, I, I think that uh, he, uh, he could have been on that list. Anthony Brown uh, should have, and, and really probably should have been on our list for best player. I mean, as far as if we're talking yeah. about best player out here at training camp, Anthony Brown has had as good a camp as anybody uh, on this team. So uh, we'll de- we definitely will give him some mention kudos at the very least yes, for his absolutely. great training camp. All right, let's uh, let's get to some more of these awards. But before we do that, I want to tell you about a fantastic new Built Bar uh, that's out right now. It's rich, delicious, indulgent cookie dough covered in chocolate. That is right. Built has done it again with the new flavor, Cookie Dough Chunk Puffs. They have a light and chewy texture, real cookie dough chunks, and of course, they are covered in 100% real chocolates. Uh, all Real chocolate, excuse me. All the joys of eating cookie dough without the hassle of making it Plus, it's healthy for you. Cookie dough chunk puffs are only 160 calories, and they have a whopping 15 grams of protein. So run to built.com to snag a box for you and the family. It will be the absolute perfect treat. Go to built.com and use the new promo code, this new one, Locked On 15 to get 15% off your next order. Use promo code Locked On 15 to check out the new cookie dough chunk puff. All right, Landon, next one. Biggest concern for you leaving Oxnard? Are we talking about like, is this a player or are we talking about? It can about, be a player. You know, it can be a position. It can be whatever you want it to be. Um, I think for me, you know, understanding what the backup tackle situation is is yeah. you know I, I i think that they probably have a plan and i think the reality of that plan is likely to kick you know whatever tackle they need outside if, if oh well i mean I, I would say if it's right tackle that josh ball would go out there i wouldn't be surprised if their plan at left tackle would be to kick tyler smith out and put connor mcgovern in because i think that they think yeah. that that puts their best five on the field if you if you need to um but it would be good to have a little bit of clarity there maybe they don't have clarity there yet um, uh, I still I, wonder what the plan is for Matt Wilensko because it feels like yeah. if you're going to have him get surgery, he already would have had it, right? But he's yeah. standing on the practice field uh, today where the Cowboys are in Denver. So I, they must believe he's going to be back sooner rather than later. Yeah, I, I, I mean, it sounds like according to what we've seen that it's not a matter of whether he needs surgery. It's about when he needs the surgery. You know, and so like eventually, like I think he can play without it and like continue to like push it off a couple of years and not like not necessarily, but it sounds like eventually he will need to have that surgery. So maybe the idea is that they see how it goes, they let it heal a little bit, see if they can get him back into the rotation and playing again. If it's just not working, then maybe you go ahead and bite the bullet and do the surgery. But I just wish they would have done it when it happened. Because that way that's you fair. can get a full off season. Like that's that's really what I wanted for him was a full off season where he's healthy and can build some strength and stuff. Now it just feels like, what are we doing? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I guess it, it depends on. We don't really understand the severity of the injury. Maybe they feel like it, it isn't quite to the level of requiring the surgery right now, and he can play a couple years without it. So we'll we'll, we'll see exactly, but. Uh, it would be nice to have a little bit of clarity on what what the plan is there. Okay, uh, yeah, I'm I'm worried about the offensive line in general, right? I I think Tyler Smith is going to have his up and ups and downs during the season. Really worried about the backup tackle situation, and I think Terrence Steele has been fine during camp, but you know, at this time last year, he was the swing tackle, and I I don't know. So this makes me a little bit nervous, especially with Tyron or uh, Tyron Smith and Zach Martin both getting a little bit older. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, I'm 
I think I think T- Terrence Steele is going to be fine. I mean, he's he's looked pretty decent out here in the camp. Obviously, he's gotten beaten by Michael Parsons a couple times, which you know can't really. Blame it's going to happen to everybody. Yeah. yeah. Um, and and I think Tyler Smith. Um, you're 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 one hundred percent right. He's going to have some growing pains. I, I tend to think that from what I've seen so far, hopefully his growing pains won't be. I mean, they'll be as painful as what we dealt with early on with the, with the guard situation last year, and then hopefully improve as the season goes on. But I, I do think uh, he immediately provides an upgrade in the run game, which hopefully will help the Cowboys a little bit. All right. Next one. Best undrafted free agent leaving Oxnard. You got it's hard to argue. options. Yeah. It's hard to argue with Marquise bell, you know, mm-hmm. um, I think Dennis Houston obviously is a guy that continues to keep that spot in that group first group. So, uh, I'll go with Marquise Bell. Uh, I think just because Houston's been solid for sure, but Bell has really shown that he could be a, a versatile piece, and and I think that they are kind of begrudgingly letting Houston run those first team wide receiver ones because he won't give up the spot. Whereas Marquise Bell, I think they're actually excited about. They actually yes. have plans for to move him around. So I'll go with Bell. Yeah, and it seems like Bell's going to have a role uh, on this yeah. defense somewhere. It's certainly on special teams. Like he's going to play and almost every single special teams unit, but I would not be surprised at all at the end of the season land. And we look at the, the snap counts in Marquis bell played 200 snaps on defense. Is this hybrid safety linebacker box player, somebody that just has a ton of athleticism that they're trying to get on the field. Um, most undrafted free agents that make rosters don't play a lot, but I think bell's got a good chance. The other one that I would have mentioned, Mike Tafua, the yep. defensive end from Utah, um, I don't know if he makes the 53 man roster, but he's done enough to get some praise from Mike McCarthy. Uh, I saw him running with the twos a couple days ago. We'll see if, if this is somebody that has a strong preseason, you know, maybe he gets three or four sacks and a bunch of pressures. Maybe the Cowboys move on from an older veteran and they keep him on the roster because he's young, uh, can give you some pass rushing upside. So we'll see. At the very least, I wouldn't be surprised if he was a guy that they tried to sneak up onto the practice squad and then became part of that crew that you call up. You know, yeah. you, know you get two of those guys a week or whatever. So, uh, I, I definitely, definitely see him with a future of the Cowboys in some form or fashion. My my hope for Tafua is that he stays in the practice squad this year. You give him some time to develop, and then next year, when Dante Fowler leaves and Terrell Basham probably leaves in free agency, he can take one of those spots as like the fourth edge rusher on the roster. Like, I think that's a very realistic kind of career path for Tafua if things work out. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. Uh, all right, let's let's uh, let's get to some more awards. Uh, this one, most entertaining camp battle. Oh, man. Um, honestly, I, I think... If we're talking about entertainment, like the Noah Brown versus uh, Semi Fahoku situation, yeah. like just like yeah. every single day, which one of them is going to make a play? And then the other one seems to make a play as well. Uh, you know, I don't know that they're like competing to knock each other off the roster. I feel like they both have, you know, good chances to make the roster, very good chances to make the roster. Um, but I, I think, you know, just seeing – there, there being so much uncertainty at the wide receiver position and then just seeing those two guys kind of make plays in and out, it just kind of uh, day in, day out, it just really made you feel a lot more comfortable about, again, maybe not quite the middle class of the wide receiver room. We still need to figure out just how good Noah Brown and Semi Fahoku are. But at the very least, it made you feel comfortable about the bottom half of the roster mm-hmm. of your wide receiver room that will be part of the 53 band roster. So. Uh, I would say those guys. Yeah, that's a good one. I've got two, actually. Uh, defensive tackle is interesting. Now, yeah. this is a little bit different from receiver because you can rotate these guys in so much. So it's not that big of a deal who's the starter and who's the backup. Like, Gallimore and Osa are going to play a ton of snaps, probably together a lot. But how does Tristan Hill factor in that? How does Carlos Watkins factor in that? Uh, that's one that's been at least intriguing for me. And then backup quarterback, just because going into camp – I didn't even think this was going to be a battle. Honestly, Lena, it just felt so much like it's Dak Prescott, it's Cooper Rush, and then we'll see if Will Greer or Ben DiNucci could show enough to maybe be the third quarterback on the 53-man roster. 
But from the sounds of it, before Will Greer kind of injured his groin and might miss a couple of days, there's a legit chance that Will Greer is the only other quarterback on the roster. And that's surprising to me. Yeah, I mean, I, I think he's really shown out here. I mean, obviously, I think we all knew. I mean, maybe we didn't all know, but anybody who follows the draft knew who Will Greer was when he came in. I mean, you heard his name all about, mm-hmm. all th- thrown out all about draft year he came out, which was, I think, two years ago, right? Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, you know, obviously put up enormous numbers in a very pass ha- happy league. And, 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 and so I uh, got a lot of press and then kind of, you know, he went to Carolina and uh, got opportunities and didn't look great. You know, <laughs> I mean, I'd be straightforward kind of, I mean, look, to be fair, he was, cir- he was playing under Matt rules. So I was, I, I was just going to say the circumstance there is that Matt, you know, Matt rule was his coach, but also I think, you know, he's a rookie quarterback playing with a under talented offense. Uh, you know, I think yeah. he had some receiving threats yeah. to be sure, but, but I think, you know, that's still not, you know, complete up to up to snuff offense yet. And um, I, I think, you know, it's, he had a historically bad game, but I think that, you know, we're not, we don't throw away talents like that just because they have a couple of games. So, you know, you fast forward to bringing him into the camp. He's shown you something. He has some athletic upside there. He certainly has an arm and you look and you compare. And again, I think we compared it yesterday, similar to the kind of, cho- the kind of choice that, that you had in front of you with the Cooper rush, Garrett Gilbert competition, except instead of, Gilbert didn't have the upside that Greer, I think, no, does. No, um, but I Greer's think it's more of a playmaker. He can make plays down the field. Yeah, I, I think I think it's more accentuated, right? Like that was the that was the conversation with Gilbert. Is okay. Well, Gilbert may provide more plays, may have some more variance to his game, positive and negative. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Cooper is kind of steady, and you know what you're getting. And ultimately, the Cowboys decided on Cooper Rush, and, and I think it paid dividends to, for them, especially in the, obviously in the Minnesota game. But now I think maybe they've looked at and seen what what they can get out of Greer, and he doesn't quite have, from what I've seen, the kind of uh, boneheaded downsides that you see with with uh, Gilbert at times. You know, Gilbert had problems just fumbling the ball or throwing it, just throwing in interceptions like just needlessly. Um, I, I haven't seen as much of that with Greer, so uh, I think Cooper Rush is a better player this year uh, uh, than he was last year. But I think Will Greer is better competition for for uh, Cooper Rush than he's ever faced so far, and I think there's a very good chance that he wins that competition. Yeah, we probably won't see Will Greer the preseason game on Saturday. It's more likely we'll see him next week. He hasn't practiced a lot this week because of that growing injury, but he's somebody I'm actually excited to watch because if you remember him back in West Virginia, like his stats were very similar to Kyler Murray and Baker Mayfield, like one of the most efficient quarterbacks we've seen in college football because so accurate throwing the ball down the field. We'll see. Uh, I'm, I'm at least intrigued by Will Greer here entering the preseason. Uh, one more. Most surprising player for you in camp. Somebody that you just been, you know, wowed from. Not, not necessarily the best player, you know, somebody that's going to make the roster, but most surprising. This is where I'm going to throw Noah Brown out there. Um, and you know what? That's who I wrote that as well. So it's perfect. I, I I just can't get over how different he looks, you know, and and um, I, I a reason I didn't necessarily put him in most improved is because I felt like he was a good player previous to this, like right? and you know uh, a useful useful player. Maybe not. Say, most like, players don't change their game yeah. at age twenty six, right? Especially when especially when you've already played four or five years in the NFL. Like those guys, we yeah. kind of know who you are at that point. Yeah, he's been in the he's been in the league for years, and he's established himself as as a certain type of player. He came into training camp, he, and he looks different. I mean, physically, but also just like. Uh, and I was talking to you, I think, or somebody else about it. it. It's his confidence. You know, he has a level of confidence in his route running. His route running has gotten crisper. He's, he's gotten more explosive out of his breaks. Uh, he's always had incredible athleticism if you go back and look at his combine numbers they are incredible like he looks they're comparable to to des bryant kind of numbers right he's big physical explosive uh but you know it just never looked like he was a competently skilled wide receiver right it's like he never just kind of learned the nuance of the position he had a role and he did the role role. well but it was that's it Right. Yeah, and it was kind of as a blocking, you know, move wide receiver type situation. He comes out here now, he's lost 10 to 15 pounds. 
He's more explosive. He's running routes with a lot more Christmas. He's running with with a, you know, this, this aggressive cockiness and confidence that you see after he's making a catch. He's popping up. He's excited. Like he is playing with him, playing, know, playing, playing, playing in himself in a way that like is 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 really impressive. And, and I and I'm just shocked to see a guy that I felt like I had a good grip on exactly what kind of player he was five years into his career at the age of 26 and he has managed to change his playing style, his play demeanor and his, uh, and his body. Uh, and it, and it reflects in the kind of ch- overall change that we've seen in the player this year. All right. So here's my kind of working theory on Noah Brown is I think, I think you see a lot of receivers at the, you know, their sixth, seventh year in the NFL. So that's when they like are completely confident in what they're supposed to be doing. And I think that's where Noah Brown's at now. The problem is a lot of those receivers, they come out as 22, 23, sometimes even 24 year olds that by the time they get to that age, their athleticism starts to diminish a little bit, not a lot, but at least a little bit. So you don't see everything click. I think the combination of Noah Brown still only being 26 years old, going into his sixth season in the league, getting a little bit slimmer, which has allowed him to become a little bit quicker. Plus he's been playing with the same quarterback his entire career now he's in the same offense. I mean, basically that he's been in for his entire career. It's not, it's a little surprising that he's breaking out now, but it's not totally shocking. No, I think it's easy for us to see what's happened and reverse engineer it, you yes. know, because, yeah. because it, it looks because of all the things you just said, like there are, there is circumstance here and his circumstances are pretty unique. You know, there yep. are just not a lot of guys who are down roster wide receivers that have kind of, top top end athleticism that come into the league young and then you know actually you know have a five year development plan and, and, and they don't but, stay in the, the the biggest thing is they don't stay with the same quarterback and they don't stay within the same system most of these guys are going to end up playing in two or three different offensive systems during that time Noah Brown has the added benefit of like he goes into these meetings and he's the veteran on this team, yeah. right? He's probably teaching, hey, CD Land, this is where you yeah, need to run this right. Run this route, excuse me. Yeah, and that's the other thing too is you know we, we have to remember that he he not only is like the oldest guy and the, the guy that has the most experience, like he was a guy that last year, uh, you know, in training camp we thought would break out. Mm-hmm. You know, he was a guy that I that seeing what he did last year, uh, he was having a similar kind of dual back and dueling banjo situation with uh, Cedric Wilson and Wilson obviously ended up kind of winning that fourth wide receiver spot and then unlocking a ton of snaps for him. Right. I I do want people to remember at this time last year, this exact time we were wondering if the Cowboys could cut Cedric Wilson to save $2 million because it was that close between him and Noah Brown. Yeah, absolutely. And so that shows you Wilson gets, got his opportunities, had an incredible year and, and parlayed it into a nice contract with Miami. Mm-hmm. I don't see any reason why Noah Brown couldn't do something similar with, with, with if given the opportunity. So uh, I, I see a guy who could be coming in here and giving us uh, potentially a really big year. I mean, I, I'm not like wide receiver two year, but could he be could a he low be- end wide receiver three? Sure. I- uh, let me give you some realistic numbers. Could he theoretically catch 39 passes for 450 yards and three touchdowns this year? Sure. And th- that's not, it's not record breaking numbers or anything, but if that's your fourth receiver on a team, that's, you know, that just needs some more competent players. Sure. I could see that. Look, you're not replace. I think what, what we all need to understand if we haven't already at this point is that you're not replacing Amari Cooper with like one guy. Yeah. Right, you you need a collection of guys to all kind of increase their numbers, increase their touches, increase their efficiency in order to get you know better play than you got last year in this offense. So Noah Brown could be one of those guys. Noah Brown could be one of those guys who's taking uh, some of those targets and 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 you know giving you solid looks uh, as part of a committee of folks that are going to you know kind of spread out and divide those I think hundred targets or so that, that mm-hmm. Cooper had last year that, that we vacated. So uh, y- you need guys like Simi. you, that's why it's exciting for guys like Simi Fahoko and Noah Brown to be having good camps is because yeah, you, you need a wide receiver three, you need a wide receiver two to, to kind of take a lion's share, but you also need to have strong guys down roster that you can rely on to yeah. also kind of give some of these targets. Cause 
none of these Gallup or or uh, uh, Tolbert aren't necessarily going to be guys who are going to get a hundred targets this year. No, themselves. and you don't want to overwork Tolbert either, no. right? And, and if you needed to take Tolbert out for twenty snaps a game, you want a guy that comes in that's not going to be a big drop off. And I think that's where Noah Brown could help, right? Hey, Noah Brown, come play on first down when it's might be a run play. We're going to have you split out wide and run up slant. Like that's where he could have a lot of value. And he's having a really, really good camp so far. Let's hope it continues. Absolutely. I completely All agree. Right. Uh, all right. Thank you for making Locked On Cowboys your first listen today. Now make your second listen to Locked On Fantasy Football Podcast. Find the intellectual fantasy expert, Vinny Iyer, who brings over 20 years of NFL ex- uh, expertise and a unique angle to give you the moves no one else has. Get ready for your fantasy draft with Locked On Fantasy Football. Or you could just follow Landon McCool on Twitter. At oh, McCool no. So I did a fantasy podcast the other day without oh, telling me. It's fine. No. It's fine. <laughs> I uh, thought I could sneak it in real quick and yeah, no one notice. And uh, it's fine. It, unfortunately, it happened. Yeah. Uh, follow the show at Locked On Cowboys. Check us out over on YouTube, Locked On Cowboys over there. Uh, you can follow me at Marcus underscore Mosier. And we'll see you guys right back here on Friday talking about the Cowboys and Broncos uh, training camp practice from Thursday. Bye, everybody. <laughs>